Hello. Hello and welcome to the session on flight. Hopefully you are having a wonderful open source summit. Um, and we have a lot of content today to cover. Uh, we have about 45 slides. Uh, we have kept them verbose, so you can follow along by reading them. Uh, but we'd also try to go through them really fast because the amount of content is a lot. Uh, so please ask your questions uh, as we go along. We will try to answer all of them in the end. Um, now that the logistics are out of the way, let's uh, introduce ourselves. So my name is Ketan. Um, I, uh, I, I work at Lyft. I'm an engineer at Lyft, and I uh, lead the project called Flight. And I also lead the machine learning platform at Lyft. Uh, Co-presenting with me today is Matthew Smith, who was also uh, who is also an engineer at Lyft. He used to work on Flight. Now leads uh, forecasting for Lyft. <clears throat> so uh, Flight was open sourced last year at KubeCon uh, in, in November 2019, uh, and or December 2019, rather. And it's been about six months of uh, very interesting times in the world and very interesting times with Flight as well. Uh, so we will start off giving a quick refresher of why we uh, started creating Flight and what the concepts and features are. Uh, we'll dive into the architecture and some of the challenges that we've uncovered while scaling up Flight in the last six months. And uh, then I'll hand over to Matt, who will we'll, we'll introduce a case study of how they use Flight in forecasting systems to deliver real business value for our customers at Lyft. Uh, then, if you have the time, we'll try to do a demo. Uh, we'll try to keep it really short. We'll introduce new concepts in flight only within the demo. Uh, and then we'll keep five minutes for questions. Uh, so let's get started. Um, this, is, uh, this slide is very interesting. It's actually uh, how we started building flight. Uh, I used to lead a team called uh, ETA. Um, ETA stands for Estimated Time of Arrival. It's a very business critical metric for Lyft because when you open up the app, you get a time uh, of how far the driver is of, or how, how far is the distance. And based on that, we derive which driver to assign to you or which how much to charge you. So when I was leading the team, I specifically was working on the offline models uh, that would estimate various different uh, parameters and, and uh, would come up with the fare calculations or estimate the traffic on the road and so on. And all of them inherently were machine learning problems. But I realized that machine learning problems are never developed in isolation. They depend on data that's probably either generated from raw data sources like you know, users or generated by other teams. And then the model itself that I wrote actually powered dispatch and many other systems downstream. So they affected it affected the downstream systems and their data and models generated. So data and ML is this complex beast which interacts with each other and are interdependent. Uh, and, and if you go back, sorry, to the previous slide, uh, each of these boxes represents a team at Lyft and the arrows represent interconnections uh, between them uh, or that flow of data or ML models. And interestingly, all of them are powered by flight. This is not a complete picture of Lyft, by the way. Uh, this is only a zoomed in part of the large picture. Uh, I couldn't have fit the entire picture on the on, a, on one slide here. All right, uh, so when we when we thought about all of these challenges, we were like, how do we attack and ta tackle them? Uh, we decided to tackle uh, some part of the stack, not all of it, and we wanted to do a good job at what we were doing. So uh, this is a very popular diagram, probably illustration that everybody's seen. Uh, the color coding here represents the part of the stack that flight tries to tackle. Um, purple, more of the purple, better flight will handle it. Uh, gray means flight does not handle it. For example, flight is not, does not provide any serving infrastructure. It can be integrated with a serving infrastructure, but it on its own is not a serving infrastructure. Uh, similarly, uh, flight is not a great tool for data collection because you might be getting data from different sources and you might be streaming that data. Flight is not a streaming engine. So you would uh, store the data in S3, but you could use Flight to essentially clean the data or extract features from it, and hence the color coding. 
now that we know uh sorry now that we know the part of the stack that we wanted to handle we we realized that most of the users were essentially um had a bunch of uh, had a had had workflows that they dealt with every day for example they would either first start with discovering data then they would clean the data then they would extract features then they would train a model uh and then downstream use that model to predict batch predict or you know deploy the model to a serving system uh and and this uh, meant for us that we wanted to orchestrate these processes for the users themselves and this orchestration we wanted to do a great job at it uh and that's why flight's tagline now is production grade orchestration for data and ml the other problem that we saw very common at lift was uh, different teams would redo the same uh, pieces of work because collaboration and reusing uh, of a, a developed ip was very hard in data systems so for example there was a upstream uh, team that would know how to let's say extract data from an open data source in this case let's talk about open street maps then you would extract the data uh, that team would extract the data provide a, a, a representation of the data for the downstream teams but in some cases a downstream team may want to access the original data source and extract another information in this case they would not be able to leverage any of the processes built by the upstream team so we wanted to uh, enable this sort of collaborative reuse and we also wanted to make it really easy to perform standardized ml ops across all the teams so what is flight flight is essentially a hosted um scalable platform for a company it is uh, it is a fabric that connects multiple open source or closed source technologies and allows uh, development of user defined workflows which are auditable repeatable and secure all of this while maintaining extensibility and observability um it it is it it, it we intend that every company that uses it provides the system as a centralized platform so that there are a lot of advantages that you can leverage with the centralized platform so to understand more of flight let's first understand some concepts uh, two of the most important core entities of flight are tasks and workflows both of these entities are uh, purely declarative version have strongly typed interfaces a task is uh the smallest indivisible portion or or entity within flight it it uh if you take an example of a programming language it would represent a function uh and you can you can write a function you can specify that it takes a few parameters and it produces few other parameters this is called as the interface of the task a workflow orchestrates multiple tasks uh managing the data flow between these tasks and produces and it's it itself takes some inputs and produces outputs on the right hand side is an example of a workflow it takes an integer float and a string and produces a string and a binary but to produce the two outputs it has to go through multiple tasks uh, the first task on the left is a spark task and the second and, and in parallel to that there is a simple python task what this means is a user is writing a code a piece of task or code that runs on spark and at the same time the user may write another piece of code that runs in python and downstream if you see there's a code written in c++ um from from the platform's point of view all of these are essentially tasks that are demarcated by their interfaces um flight will automatically create a spark cluster for the users manage the life cycle of the cluster uh and uh, manage all the dependencies within their system and then also massage the data into the system let spark handle the right thing and then produce the, uh, and then store the data and massage it into the next bit so let's take uh, as we said let's take an example let's take a few examples of tasks um on the right hand side uh is a spark task you write spark by spark code in this case you do not it's not different from writing any regular pyspark code so if you are counting words you can take the example from the internet drop it into a function and decorate it with uh, one of the decorators that comes with like kit uh, then also uh, optionally you might want to annotate with a set of inputs that it takes and produces a set of outputs 
this informs the platform that these are the inputs parameterizable. Any other type system in a programming language, so it's very uh, composable. The second example at the bottom is running an arbitrary container. It's taking a container from open source, in this case, an open CV container, passing an image to it, and it produces another image, uh, passes an image to it, uh, creates another image, which is um, just the edges uh, extracted from that image. On the left-hand side is an example written in Scala. Uh, and this is uh, help. This is created by Spotify. They have a new flight kit called Flight Kit Java that allows you to express tasks and workflows in Java or Scala. And in, in, interesting things, tasks are independent entities. They can be executed uh, independently. We'll, we'll show that in the demo. OK, now that we know tasks, uh, let's put them together into a workflow. Workflows are composable and declarative entities. Uh, on the left-hand side is an example of a workflow composed of other workflows. Or a workflow can be composed of tasks, which is on the right-hand side. It is, it's a, it is a typical workflow for a machine learning pipeline. You take some data, you split it into training and validation set, you fit a model, and then you compute metrics on it. Um, this is a very standard workflow uh, for a machine learning at Lyft or mostly at other companies. You can also associate schedules to a workflow and you can associate more than one schedule. Uh, and this is because workflows exist in isolation and they, each execution exists in isolation as well. Um, when, we, when we built Flight initially, we wanted everything to be static and uh, the interfaces to be also statically defined. This makes it extremely easy to actually verify that the workflow will work um, or at least compile. What compilation here means, it verifies all the inputs passed into the workflow, which are passed into a task and further down to another task, will all work because their types match. For example, a task produces, let's say, an integer and a string. And a downstream task consumes two float values. You cannot uh, create a data connection between the upstream task and the downstream task. It will cause a compile time failure, just like you would get compilation failures in a type safe language like Go or C++. But users wanted some dynamism. Uh, so this is possible only if everything's statically defined. Uh, and statically defined means you actually define the structure of the workflow and you define the structure of the uh, task ahead of time. But as we started using uh, Flight, people wanted dynamism. And dynamism is very useful in some cases. Uh, let's take an example. Uh, on the right-hand side on the top, there is a workflow uh, of D is the node in, in that workflow or in that graph which wants to generate a new workflow based on some user-provided input. Um, and so it just spits out a um, workflow that the flight engine knows how to work with. This comes with some risks. Uh, this workflow may not be conformant, so it may not produce the exact outputs that uh, you desire, or it may be broken just because it's uncompilable. Uh, this, uh, this looks similar to like Java's JTAG. Where, you, where the user produces uh, the workflow and the flight backend will dynamically compile it and make sure that it's going to run. Otherwise, they get an error. Uh, and that is the trade-off you have to do with dynamism. Another very good example of where dynamism is useful is given the set of uh, data corpus, let's assume a million images, I want to classify uh, the images, whether they have a dog or a cat. Uh, and this is a very classical uh, model, uh, CNN model that you can use. So let's say we use the model, but the problem here is how do I scale it so that it happens very quickly? So I may run 100 uh, instances of uh, the predictor where each instance will handle uh, 10,000 or 1,000 uh, images. And Flight makes it really easy. These are called array jobs, and you just launch uh, 100 uh, containers, or you, you tell Flight that I want to run, launch 100 of them, and it will schedule the data uh, bits correctly. And this is done using dynamic workflows. Another important concept uh, in flight is projects and domains. Projects are logical groupings of workflows. 
and domains provide CI CD like semantics to workflows. So a user when he's iterate when they are iterating on their workflows, they usually just use the development domain. Once they are confident, they push it to something like pre-prod where they can run smoke tests. And once they are confident with that, they push it to production where it starts serving production information. This is also great for accounting and auditability. It's also great for sharing. What do I mean by that? Let's take an example. Project A on the left-hand side uh, has a, a pipeline A, which let's assume it's a feature engineering pipeline. So you're taking in some data sets and computing some features from it. They also have a model which works with that feature. Project B on the right-hand side uh, wants to use the same set of features, but apply another transform to those features and then run the same model. In the typical scenario, you would copy, paste, or you would have to create a central light representation of the feature and then share it. In, in flight, instead, you can just share the code without really sharing the code. You would share the reference to the code so that uh, project A can keep on updating the versions of the code, while project B is just a consumer. And they can also consume the model in the same way. So on the right-hand side, if you say we can just fetch a representation of the pipeline, compose a new pipeline out of it, and add the task while transforming it using T1. But there is a problem. Does that mean you compute the same features again and again now that you've uh, composed it? No, you don't need to. Uh, and this is where Flight Data Catalog fits in. A Flight Data Catalog uh, allows a thing called as memoization. So let's take an example in this case. W1 is a workflow that composes of two other workflows, W2 and W3. And it let uh, some execution of W1 has a failure in W3's task edge. Let's stay, let's uh, let's further complicate this example. What if the entire execution takes many many days? Let's say it takes two days to execute, and task edge is takes five minutes to execute, but it has a bug. So now, if it has a bug, uh, you can fix the bug. But what is the modus operandi going forward for the user of W1? Is, is, is are they supposed to launch a new execution of W1 and then pay the penalty of the computation for two days? If you use flight catalog memoization, then you don't have to. Uh, we know the inputs and outputs, and we know the version of the task. So we can quickly memoize the, the previous outputs if the inputs and outputs and the versions match. This is called the signature of a task. And in this case, when you run W1 again, you will see that W2 previously completed, uh, task G previously completed, and so immediately flight will go to start executing task sketch. And this makes the total uh, iteration time, bring it brings it down by two days in this case. This has another uh, interesting artifact. It, it maintains a causal dependency structure of all the data as it was produced and consumed. And this is what we call as artifact lineage. Uh, Okay, uh, when we now we decided to build all of this, we wanted our users to not think about machines and, and we wanted to have a centralized system where uh, we, we will be able to amortize the cost of running lots of large data intensive applications. Um, and so we decided to make it serverless for the users. As a team, my team manages the services, uh, the, the machines for all of the users. They just request for CPUs, GPUs, memory, number of Spark executors, and dynamagically all of this is created and, and given back. This entire system is uh, available behind a gRPC REST interface. Uh, and because of this construction, it is completely language agnostic. And this is proven by two FlightKit variants that we have, FlightKit Python and FlightKit Java. Or you can just use raw containers from the internet. When something fails or something succeeds, you can get notifications. Uh, and you can always keep a history of all the executions uh, modulo the, the uh, configuration of uh, retention. Uh, you can retrieve results for as long as you want, because flight captures all the executions and their outputs. But when we first, uh, so flight has gone through a couple of iterations within the company. And when we first launched, we realized that all our users wanted to constantly evolve and change the platform. We realized when we were 
we're building the latest the, the version that is in the open source of flight uh we realized that we should absolutely make it extensible to the core uh, and so uh and, and matt will talk about like how he extended the python sdk to do interesting things but we also wanted the backend to be extensible and backend extensibility is extremely useful to add new capabilities to flight like distributed training spark SageMaker, and we'll see some of that in the demo uh, and this comes built in with flight so you can keep on adding extensions and making it smarter and smarter Okay, if that has not convinced you, uh, let me give another slide why we think uh, flight would be beneficial for you to uh, for you to use flight. Flight is used at Lyft at produ in production at scale. We run more than a million workflow executions, and if you see to the far right of this diagram on the right, the the uh, the ramp is going up and higher every day. But what is that central blip that I see? <laughs> there was one time where uh, earlier in the year or late last year, when we had a huge spike and then a drop. Let's get back to it in a couple slides. To power this execution uh, engine, uh, it's important to architect the system to for scale. So the system has been architected following um, the architecture pattern set by Kubernetes. It is a simple user plane, control plane, data plane uh, concept, like all other cloud native technologies. Uh, flight admin and flight console on the right hand side are from the control plane, flight propeller, and Kubernetes itself forms the data plane. And on the left hand side are various components that interact with these things using, using the service API. But by default, all of this is if you are able to run this in a single Kubernetes cluster just by applying a, a YAML that is that we that we create every every time we release a new version. All right, so let's get back to what happened. Uh, so when what happened is that we had a super exponential growth, and uh, in two days we ramped from uh, I want to say about fifty thousand a day or, or a couple of days workflows to to whatever hundred hundred and fifty thousand, uh, or maybe less than fifty thousand initially. So it was about six x, and that was hard on flight because we were not ready. Users lacked the visibility. Uh, system admins were overwhelmed, and various Kubernetes components started failing. We saw problems in etcd. We saw problems in scheduler, control plane, and flight propeller itself is pretty complex. It handles a lot of data, and we saw some problems there too. So we decided to dive deep. So we started addressing one by one the problems. Problem number one: Let's address scale. We decided to scale out and scale up. By scale up, uh, we meant flight propeller itself was optimized heavily so that it can run uh, 2,000 th plus concurrent workflows without any change in latency characteristics. Uh, and this is, this happens on one machine. And you can easily shard flight propeller to multiple machines. Uh, then we also decided to scale up, scale out to multiple Kubernetes clusters. This allows us to have uh, different fault domains as well as, um, as well as mitigates many problems with Kubernetes control plane. Another problem was multi-tenancy. There were these large gorilla of users that would come and run their large workloads while the smaller users uh, would not uh, be able to uh, get the fair share of resources. So flight, um, so we started using projects to contribute to multi-tenancy primitives. For example, we leverage Kubernetes resource quotas but that was not enough, so we had to build our own resource manager on top of the Kubernetes quotas. The resource manager also uh, provides things like fair queues and uh, also helps in maintaining quotas on downstream services. Like if BigQuery has a concurrency limit, you can uh, protect BigQuery from uh, browning out. Another problem was visibility. Flight has been trying to improve visibility from day one, and but we have we have been we kept on improving it. For example, if you run a Spark job, you get immediate link to Spark logs, Spark history UI. You, we get a Grafana template that shows how the workflow is performing or how all of the workflows in a user's uh, domain or project are performing. And they can see how the memory usage is uh, changing over time and so on. Also, Flight uh, demarcates user versus system errors really nicely so that the users know exactly when to uh, contact the system administrators. Another problem was we wanted extreme visibility so that we can maintain it, uh, maintain flight very easily. And that's also a Grafana template that's coming to OSS soon. Um, moreover, flight admin 
has a, a interesting uh, and flexible routing system so that it can route various messages, uh, various workflows to different uh, clusters. And this helps us in actually deploying the control plane and the data plane in an in a in a progressive manner. So you can actually bake it in a lower intensity or lower lower criticality cluster before you, uh, rolling it out to a more critical cluster. And eventually, you want the platform because it's a centralized platform to be efficient. We saw a lot of problems with um, cluster autoscaler and KLS scheduler. We started optimizing them. We've we've uh, observed more than 25% in saving just by optimizing some of the things. And these are now available with Flight Open Source. We also utilize spot instances if you are on AWS. And we provide a deep visibility to our users on where they are spending the cost. So this has been the biggest driver in saving a lot of money for our users. On the right-hand side is a dashboard that we built on top of Superset. And we are trying to see how we can open source that. All right, so I know that was very quick, a lot of information. But uh, hopefully, uh, you got something out of it. And uh, you can ask me more questions. But I'll hand over to Matt, who will talk about real-time forecasting uh, and how they use flight at, in real-time forecasting. Thank you. Thanks, Kathan. Uh, so I'll give a quick introduction, uh, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, like Kathan mentioned at the beginning, um, he and I kind of worked together back all the way when we are on the ETA team, building kind of the first iteration of flight. Um, out of that, we kind of expanded into this platform that ended up kind of supporting the entire company, growing, I think, to maybe 30 or 40 teams using us around the company. And I stayed with flight through open sourcing in December. Uh, it was a really exciting journey. Um, and then just a few months ago, uh, I moved over to lead the real-time forecasting team at Lyft. Um, and that kind of makes me maybe a little bit of a unique user of flight in the sense that uh, we're maybe the first team where someone who has actually worked on flight and really knows the system well has uh, taken it and built a uh, you know real ML product on top of it. Uh, this didn't say that other teams aren't doing it, but uh, you know I like to think maybe I have a little bit more in-depth knowledge than some. So to give a little bit of background about what real-time forecasts are, um, we're a business-focused streaming infrastructure, and I put business-focused in italics because uh, you know we really don't want to spend a lot of time dealing with uh, compute on the back end. We want to really use these kind of serverless platforms, weave together kind of the best. Uh, in breed type solutions um, from open source within Lyft uh, and just make those be very agile and making those kind of mesh together nicely for delivering real time forecasts. That's what our team is kind of evaluated against our ability to generate high quality forecasts uh, to power the product. Um, and, you know, so there is this streaming online component, but as people who are probably, you know, if you're familiar with. Uh, kind of what a real-time model actually does, um, you know there's massive amounts of offline components to it. There's the training, there's the tuning, there's regular evaluations of the model health. Um, you want to be able to run large-scale back tests on new models. Um, and then as far as actually advancing models into production, there's workflow-driven aspects of that as well. Uh, you might want to run some integration tests and kind of health checks in a simulated environment before advancing things uh, to serve real traffic. You serve real traffic and you don't go through these gates, uh, you might find out that you're uh, really causing some pain for the business. Um, so here's a little bit of a high level view of our current architecture. Um, and I'll start with kind of the online component, which is up here at the top uh, in the dotted box. So it's called a streaming, uh, labeled streaming process. What we're doing is we're taking observations, uh, and these are temporal spatial observations. So these are big, fat requests. Uh, it's information about very minute details of a region. Uh, and we're bringing those into the streaming engine, uh, which will do some kind of filtering. It's fairly simplistic at the moment. But then eventually it's going to have to call this model predict code, uh, which currently we host uh, using Flask. And 
by some kind of magic provided by Lyft, it's very easy for us to deploy those up and we'll have multiple versions even of maybe the same model running at the same time, uh, producing kind of, again, these pieces of data that we can kind of A-B test against each other. Uh, and eventually those will end up in Druid, or at least a summary of them will end up in Druid, which we then serve to teams that consume our forecasts. But besides that, you know, this, as I mentioned, this data is very uh, high bandwidth. So we are also doing kind of this additional work where we have to drop it into an offline context. So as you can see, there's some arrows where you kind of split off to the side and we're putting things into S3. And at this point, we haven't really had time to organize them or do anything with it uh, because it would be too detrimental to our performance. Uh, and that's where flight kind of comes in, which is what drives our offline orchestration. Um, right now we have kind of three major things running in flight, which is our training pipelines. So it's gonna be consuming this data that's being dropped over time, maybe going way back in history, you know, we're talking pretty much the entire history we've ever collected at Lyft, perhaps, uh, to retrain our model and adapt to uh, changes in the environment, um, especially with things like going on today with COVID, uh, you know, that agility and retraining is extremely important. Uh, we also have kind of some data compaction and schema evolution workflows that are happening offline. These are kind of pulling in the, that, we'll say, unschematized data coming, just being dropped into S3 and making sense of it, pre-joining it, putting it into Hive, making it available to our dashboards. Uh, and then we also have monitoring workflows, which will do kind of these batch analysis, um, which, you know, might require massive spark jobs uh, that can really look back in time and, uh, you know, put these metrics out into our Grafana dashboards, but also drive pages, um, Slack messages, notifications, things letting us know that our, uh, you know, system is maybe kind of on the downturn. Um, so in building out this kind of product, uh, how we work as a team is there's uh, the engineering group, which I lead, and we work very closely with some research scientists uh, who really just want to kind of focus on the business logic uh, and so what we try to do is kind of bridge this gap between the backend system of Flight and Flask uh, and some kind of simplistic models on their side. Uh, I blew up this little pink box here, which shows kind of a divide of the system code, which would be owned by my team. Uh, basically, we have this framework library that sits on top of either FlightKit or Flask, uh, depending on which environments it's uh, executing in, and then we have kind of a simple way for uh, our scientists to implement predict, train, and evaluate methods. And I'll go into a little more detail on that. Um, yeah, so in this user journey, uh, you know, it's pretty typical. You start with an ideate and iterate phase uh, where you write the business logic, you want to test locally at small scale, iterate very quickly, and then eventually put it into a offline environment where you can maybe look through a large amount of real production data, detect anomalies, uh, and kind of test things out. And you're gonna kind of probably go through this cycle a few times. You wanna do it very quickly and efficiently. Uh, but once you're happy with that, you move into the productionization phase. You wanna promote your model uh, in, a, uh, you know, in a CICD driven way. Uh, you'll wanna add schedules onto the training uh, pipelines and you want to maybe even also be able to do some ad hoc executions to recover from failures and that sort of thing. Uh, and of course, monitor and really get like a good understanding of the data your system's producing. And then there's kind of the final phase, retrieve and replay. Obviously things eventually go wrong, models drift, bugs come in, um, systems themselves evolve, maybe the features you're ingesting change. And you wanna be able to quickly kind of go back to that idea and iterate phase to repair things. So uh, it becomes very important to be able to retrieve kind of your artifact lineage uh, and kind of have these reproducible uh, environments where you can, you know, isolate the error and idea and iterate on very quickly to repair and go back into production. So in this first phase, uh, you know, 
ideate, we have the right business logic portion. And as I mentioned, there's kind of this divide. There's the framework author and there's the ML suite or scientist who's writing the model code on the left. Uh, this is kind of the interface that we produce for our scientists and ML suites. Uh, if you've developed a model at your company, it, you probably have a very similar abstraction. It's just a Python class with some inputs and outputs. Uh, it has a predict method, a train method. Um, and the framework author on the other side would just kind of have offered, authored this base class that sits nicely uh, in either, you know, on top of FlightKit for the offline executions and also uh, on top of Flask for the things that are actually running in production. So um, another thing to, I guess, mention is these ML SWEs and scientists, they never actually deal with flight. You know, flight is a very powerful tool, but it can be a bit, um, you know, all the knobs can get kind of overwhelming. So what we try to do is just to abstract that away where we define the flight tasks, the workflows, uh, et cetera, and know and define kind of the semantics by which these uh, business logic or these methods driven by business logic can fit into the overall framework. Um, so as part of ideation, we want to kind of smooth the testing for our uh, users. And again, we can kind of leverage flight here in its kind of reproducible aspect. As Kathan had mentioned, we have an API where you can basically retrieve all the information of a past execution um, and be kind of alerted even on when ex executions fail. So uh, we can take that information and use Flight to resurrect those inputs and bring them into a local uh, context and allow people to kind of mess around with them. So to kind of show what the flow might look like, you can look at, here's a snippet of our Flight UI. Uh, the user goes in and says, oh, this failed. And then maybe just copies this ID into a notebook where they've loaded our library and voila, they'll get a pandas data frame that you know they can look into, find where maybe there was a null or a value that was uh, you know causing havoc in their code. So you know that makes it pretty easy to do these kind of small scale testing and evaluations. Um, but then again, we want to eventually make sure that uh, you know we have kind of the full big picture view, see how something can stacks up against you know a year's worth of data. Uh, and again, to make that easy on the model author, all they do is open a pull request, wait for a container to build. And in the background, our framework has ensured that all the tasks and workflows are created and registered, uh, and that we also have made some tools for them so they can call like command line interface, uh, which will end up kicking off some back testing and executions that will then uh, also give a report perhaps of its performance. So, you know, there's a lot of code, but this is kind of an example of what a testing workflow would look like that's supported by our framework. Uh, you know, it fetches data, it'll train the model uh, with the user code that's specified in that container. It'll then predict again with that exact user code that was submitted into a PR. Uh, and then we'll run health metrics on it and produce a report. Uh, and this all kind of happens invisibly behind a CLI called forecast CLI. And you can see you just give it a test command, lay out some models, some start dates, some end dates. For us, it's a whole year. Uh, and that'll go in the background, execute a task in flight. Flight will see to it that all that data gets you know, brought into these massive processes. And, you know, this might include a fleet of hundreds of machines at a time just churning on all this information uh, and synthesize all the outputs uh, and just report them back to us. And it was very easy on our side in the framework to make this happen because we just use FlightKit. It has some nice wrappers around the APIs. And, you know, it's actually literally just maybe 10 lines of code to support that kind of use case. So now moving into the productionization phase, uh, again, the model author is going to check in the code. They want to wait for some integration tests to pass. So again, we might look at past data, bring that into a large offline process, 
look at the health report that comes out of it and ensure that it's asserted against some things. Uh, and then they'll roll out stage by stage, perhaps going into staging, you know, canary, and then production, uh, and have the ability to kind of monitor those things. And thanks to Flight, uh, you know, we get a lot of that kind of for free. And again, it's just the framework author kind of pulling together these things through the SDK and API uh, to make it possible. Uh, so again, kind of like the framework author might create kind of an integration testing method, again, using just the flight kit uh, and it simply asserts that after the runs complete on flight, that was totally managed by flight, uh, that the scores pass and we get past, go keep going on the gate. Um, I'll skip over this, but again, this is kind of just showing when you go to release things, we elevate these pipelines side by side with this uh, code that's going into our online process. So this means we might have a uh, our container, which contains all the user business logic, is simultaneously being elevated as a Flask service. And at the same time, we have the exact same container running in these offline processes. And that gives us this really beautiful, consistent view um, across our entire process online and offline. It makes it very easy to make sure your data lines up when the interfaces change, that you evolve schemas nicely. Um, so it's been very helpful using Flight for that. And again, uh, you know, with Flight, we get, we've hooked up into the kind of uh, integrations they have made with PagerDuty and Wavefront and Slack. Uh, we get emails and Slack notifications when our training jobs fail. We get page so we can take corrective action. If our health metrics start to decline, we'll get pages. We can look at Wavefront and track uh, the output of these kind of processes over time. Uh, and it really just, you know, as you probably, people probably know, monitoring model health is actually an extremely difficult problem. So it's really great when a lot of it kind of comes for free. And it's just a matter of making sure your dashboards focus on the right metrics. So then again, uh, you know, things might have been in production working nicely for a while, but inevitably something will go wrong. There will be an anomaly in behavior. The market will shift. The model will drift. Uh, or, you know, we'll just come across an edge case bug. And how do we go back and make use of this wealth of data we've gathered over time and re-ideate on this model so we can iterate and uh, correct things? So. We want to create a situation where it's basically a one-click tool for common debug paths, uh, so you could retry maybe an inference that had failed in production uh, and see the exact data that comes in. Or if there's drift, we might want to do kind of a batch comparison uh, in an offline manner. Um, so we have a tool where, uh, again, the forecast CLI, we allow them to debug a failure, they'll give an inference ID, and we'll actually drop them into a auto-generated notebook, uh, which uh, is pre-populated with the exact code, um, with the exact inputs, the exact outputs. So at your fingertips automatically right away, you basically have a reproduction of the failed environment. And then you can kind of make some functions locally in your notebook, twist things around and get into that kind of ideation loop. Um, and the reason why this is possible is, again, because of flight and kind of its auditability, we're able to go back and find actual executions that are linked to a specific Git SHA. So we have exactly the code. Uh, we have exactly the training artifacts that may have powered that model. And we can pull this full closure of information together in a very seamless way. Uh, so again, users and makes things, uh, well, it's made easy on our side thanks to kind of the rich APIs on flight. So that's kind of wraps up uh, how we use it currently for real-time forecasting. Uh, you know, we see going even farther with all this, uh, you know, we want to, right now we kind of serve our forecasts in a real-time online s system, but we want to onboard more teams. Uh, we want them to 
be able to consume our forecasts in their offline environments so they can train against forecasts. And we want to do that in a really seamless manner. And as Kathan was talking about, uh, with the shareability, we think that's a pretty simple next step. Uh, so we're going to see more, we're going to drive more adoption of forecasting uh, at Lyft. And I think Flight's going to be kind of the main powering component of that. And I'll hand this back to Kathan now to give a quick demo or answer questions, uh, given we have only about five minutes left. Thanks. Hey, uh, thank you, Matt. I think um, forecasting is one of the most complicated use cases because it is a platform of its own. They, they produce an artifact that is consumed downstream from by a lot of other teams. So um, they have built a very slick framework on top of flight. Uh, there are many other users of flight who directly consume flight without building any frameworks, and those are simpler use cases. Uh, the real the real time offline parity makes the forecasting framework really interesting and hard. Uh, thank you, um, Matt, for the excellent overview. Let me uh, I'll try to do a demo. Uh, we I will time box it to like two minutes. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'll get done with much of it, but uh, I basically have some primed uh, Jupyter notebooks here, and I'm going to quickly walk through them. Uh, and while we are working, I will execute them. Uh, so a couple of helper functions. And what we have is a simple uh, method uh, that actually detects uh, edges from a given image. And so I had an image. I had the Linux uh, penguin locally. And then I detected edges. And the function works fine. The function is also written locally in the Jupyter Notebook. And now what I did is. Um, I'm going to run this on uh, on flight, and so I declare uh, this is a new task type available on flight. So you can run raw containers. Just booked up a container from open source. That's an open CV container, uh, and wrote the script. I pass the script in as an argument, um, and pass an image, and you know retrieve the uh, results. So let's run that, and I can now execute just that one function itself. And so the moment I execute, I get a link. We can jump to it. It's executing. Uh, and so uh, let it run. Till that time, I'll show you another one that we are working on. Uh, it's called SageMaker integration. So SageMaker is a popular framework, uh, or well, not a framework, but a platform written by Amazon that allows you to train um, models in a distributed setting if you want to. So in this case, what we have done is we have taken <coughs> XGBoost model. Um, that's the algorithm specification. Um, and SageMaker allows you to have multiple algorithms specified. We wrap it into a training system. So this is the training model. Uh, it's available. Uh, and you specify what type of instance you want to use, what instance counts. And, uh, and, and of course, with SageMaker, you can use flight primitives too, like cacheable. So you are creating an artifact lineage in here. But let's not run this model. Let's run a hyperparameter optimization on top of it. That means you take one model, try out different hyperparameters, and find the best fitting model. And so to do that, we wrap the, the training model in with a hyperparameter optimizer. Uh, and these are just shims written in the Python SDK so that we can easily call uh, SageMaker API. Uh, but SageMaker API is integrated with the backend. So it's a backend plugin. Um, and when you execute it, um, this should launch an execution. And if you go to there, it should launch an execution. And this is actually running on our staging cluster in production right now. Uh, let's go back to the existing one. Oh, so that completed. Uh, let's click on the task. Uh, you can see the inputs and outputs. You'll see, oh, some output was produced. We can take that output and see what was generated. Uh, let's go back down over there. I, I will not. You can, of course, create it into a workflow and register and execute it. But I'm just going to skip to the last part. So we'll just modify this. Uh, and that's it this way. So what happened is I actually passed image, this image, into the edge detection algorithm, uh, which was an HTTP link. It's from the uh, it's from the web. And it uh, performed edge detection remote. And I did not leave the Jupyter Notebook at all. And this entire thing is captured in the UI, and you can go back and see the history of execution. At the same time, we also ran uh, hyperparameter optimizer. Um, and so the input specified were the hyperparameter ranges, uh, and the output was a model. Uh, and so this is the model we got. If you go back, we can just do a sync and say, what the, what's the model that I got? Boom. And you can see the model, and you can retrieve the, download the model and use it. Um, 
uh, this is all showing single task execution. So what we want to get away from is that this has been a question that people have asked us recently. Is flight a workflow orchestration tool? Yes, it is a workflow orchestration tool, but we think that the, it's the user's workflow orchestration tool. And a user starts their journey usually from starting one task at a time, like training a model or extracting, writing a Spark job. And flight, help, flight helps you there. You write one function, you execute that function, then you say like, okay, maybe I need to add another function because the one was not enough. Let's say you are extracting a feature, you want to apply a transform to it, a distributed transform to it. So you write another function, then you put them together into a pipeline. Then you add another function, you put them together into a pipeline, then you productionize it and you schedule it to run or you run ad hoc based on some triggers. So that was a very, very quick demo. I am really sorry I had to rush through it. But uh, I want to jump through the next couple of slides. Basically, our ecosystem is evolving every day. Uh, we are we're getting uh, more and more along the way. And we basically develop only the things that currently are used at Lyft uh, and when, which we are confident of will run at scale. Uh, we ship out. But if you have requirements, ping us and we will work with you. Um, Flight has a lot of new tools coming in, but we are going to focus extremely on UI improvements and uh data catalog uh, visualization and that's about it let's uh, open up the session for questions i actually don't see many questions so um we did we finish our talk then <laughs> a couple minutes in advance i don't see any questions nope and no uh, we'll keep an eye on the window for a few more minutes Okay, here we go. We got one. Oh, we, what, what algorithm, algorithm do you use for time series forecasting? Uh, can you hear me, by the way, Kathan? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, yeah, so the algorithm we use is actually entirely in house based. Um, you know, it's totally concocted by our uh, research scientists. So, um, what they, I think our most recent one is an online based model, um, which looks at kind of past history and trains, I think, a uh, gradient descent SK learn model. Uh, but really, uh, you know, we try to kind of abstract away the concept of what actual algorithm might be there. We really just care about piping the right inputs and outputs and letting the user go wild um, in actually, uh, you know, predicting or training. Okay, the next question is, have you tried profit? Uh, oh, profit for time series forecasting. Uh, Matt, again, that's a question for you, I think. We have not, so uh, I think I'll have to look into that. It sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, it's by Facebook, so yeah. Um, I think, uh, so that's the interesting part from my point of view, I think profit can be integrated with flight. Uh, and I think uh, what from Matt's point of view, these are black boxes. You can use a RNN style model for time series forecasting where you profit. Um, so, uh, how do you compare flight with MLflow? So, I am not an expert on MLflow, so don't. Uh, uh, I may be wrong in some cases, but from my understanding, MLflow is a library to track experiments, uh, and it is uh, you still use. You can use it with anything, uh, Spark or uh, other frameworks. Um, we are more than that. We are a workflow orchestration and a computation platform. We run Spark itself. And uh, tracking of experiments is a byproduct of like, running everything on flight. Um, while MLflow, it's it's not a byproduct of that. You can go to Databricks and run your Spark job or use MLflow. If you don't use MLflow, you don't get the traffic. That's my understanding. Um, the next question, what do you think about feature stores? Oh, I. I actually uh, like the idea of feature stores, but I don't think feature stores um, should exist as purely uh, computed data only because the amount of data that you uh, compute becomes ex exorbitantly high. And if you keep on computing every single feature that the user wants, uh, and if you do not have great discovery on them, it's very easy to overwhelm the system. So I believe that features uh, store should actually have references in some cases to the code that generated the feature and then generate the features. Um, 
Yeah, I think I could maybe add a little bit there as well, which is, uh, you know, kind of the work we're doing in streaming forecasters, kind of filling gaps that currently exist in the feature store solutions at Lyft. Uh, we don't really have an approach that works for the bandwidth of data that we work with. Uh, so in a way, we've kind of created this abstraction like a feature store that's driven by flight. And again, as Kathan mentioned, it's very uh, reactive. It responds more to the need for data as opposed to uh, pre-computing. And we think we can maybe upstream this concept to a broader offering within Lyft because, yeah, ideally, this should be fully abstracted for everyone. Like, yep, getting access to features is a very common problem, uh, and being able to have a federated approach is just really important in the ML system. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a feature store is more of a hybrid system over here. That's what we are getting at uh, instead of just computation or storage. Uh, I don't know if you have any more time to do questions, uh, moderator. So please wrap yep. up. So, <laughs> yeah, we are ready to wrap uh, wrap up, and we can take questions uh, offline or join our flight Slack. And please ask questions over there. Go to flight.org. Looking forward to more questions. Uh, would love to interact with the community. Thank you. Bye.